on the website too, so you can get to it. And we are live. All right. How do you? Thanks, Ray, for having me here. Uh, that's really exciting. Hello, everyone. Um, so today I'll be talking about a topic that actually we face it every day in our life, urgency versus importance. But I will put the spin on the global health aspect of it. Um, so it's something like today, for example, on the way here, Ray asked me if I want to seriously. It's just like the line was really long. And you, you wonder that what is really important in life um, or something that you have to do it today or something that is like just important that has to be done. So that would be the aspect of this uh, presentation. And also, that's something that uh, you face it. Are you now in the mid midterms period? Yes, no, yeah, okay. And while you are in the middle of the studying, how often this happened to you? Breaking up, some bad news showing up, it's going to uh, screw up everything for you, right? And you'll be like, okay, I'm going to study. I have to deal with this crisis. So it's about crisis, where you weigh your options and what is really important. Now, this is what would be the difference between urgency and importance? Anyone? Go ahead. I thought you raised your hand. Sure. Okay, so it has to be any, anyone else? Any other thoughts? Yep. Uh, I was just like more generally, like urgency just has a time aspect to it, whereas importance doesn't necessarily have. So urgency might be like, like she said, like it could be limited to one day, but it could also be limited to like you have a certain time frame that it needs to be done in, whereas importance might be more flexible and like it needs to be done, but it's not a set time. Frame. Okay, so time is an important factor again. Um, so it's, it's, it's always there's this thin line between them, right? There's always this thin line. And sometimes when it's urgency, emotions can be included in it, in this, uh, in this, in this factor on, on, depending on the situation as well. Um, I want to show you this blank table to keep it in mind because this model, I'm going to introduce it later on. But now, when I will show you the, the coming slides, keep thinking about these elements. Urgent, not urgent versus important, not important. And what are the things that you can put them here? For example, attending the session today. Ray, close your eyes. <laughs> How would you rate it? If I would say important and urgent, raise your hands. He's not looking. OK, none. Important, not urgent. Perfect. Not important, urgent. Close your eyes. OK, not important, not urgent. OK, you can open your eyes. Thanks. <laughs> so it's and, and anything else as well on for your exams, for the decision on the university, for your career. So this is for on a personal level. Now, when I, you put the global health perspective in it, when you're talking, when we are talking about money, about human resources, where we need medical doctors, where we need midwives, nurses, uh, where we need uh, lab technicians, where we need drugs. So that's something uh, that you will face it if you decide to go in a global health career you'll be facing this on a daily basis, especially if you go into a decision-making position. Now, when we are talking about diseases here, health is about diseases. So you look also at the shift in 1990, you can look at the shift globally among all countries, what were the priorities for health or the burden on health. So you can see it starts with uh, respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go down. And when it's orange color, it's the communicable diseases or maternal neonatal diseases. And the blue, it's non-communicable non diseases. And the light blue is injuries. So in 2010, 
what would be your prediction or your guessing? What is the priority in health or burden on health? I hate to pick on someone. Yeah. Heart disease. So non-communicable diseases. Who else? Yep. HIV. HIV. Infectious diseases. One more person? Who has the courage here? Come on. Yep. Depression. Depression. That's interesting. That's actually an emerging topic. Mental health. Here you go. So it's really changing. There's a big shift happening. HIV has increased. Why do you think this is happening? Yep. Um, a lot more public awareness of HIV and media posting how bad it is. OK, public awareness. Yeah. Epidemiologically, this is a very important point. That's true in terms of diagnostics, especially for cancer. Early screening, this is a very important point. Educational as well, it's very important. And keep in mind, I want to keep reminding you about the two terms, urgent and important. Education and diagnostics. That was an important topic. It was not urgent, but today we see its factor. Education in terms of uh, health promotion and health prevention, that's also an important topic. Anyone else would think about something that was a, something ur urgent factor that it required an intervention and then this has affected the increase or reduction of the burden? Okay, keep that thought. So now we went through the concept of urgency and importance, then through the burden of diseases, okay, and then through that to think about this concept on an individual level. Now try to think about it if you were taking place of one of these guys here. So when we are talking about Bill Gates and Bill Clinton, they are both leading foundations to, to provide funding in global health to make change. So they, they have a vision of what is important to, to tackle, and they will release funding. And then researchers like Ray, me, will be um, competing for this funding and then to implement their agenda. Okay. For Peter Singer, the same. Uh, Grand Challenges Canada, it's the same thing. He's based in Toronto, and they are strong partners with Bill Gates Foundation. For UNICEF, they are tackling children around the world, and everything surrounding children and uh, mother's health, they are dealing with them. Uh, Mr. Michel Sidebi, he's the CEO of UNAIDS, or the president of United Nations for AIDS, and they are tackling everything surrounding HIV AIDS. Nelson Mandela, former politician. And I will talk about him later on because he had, he was in a very interesting situation that people were always criticizing him that he was not tackling HIV when he was president. And we'll talk about it. So try to think about these people here in terms of categories as politician, policymaker, as someone uh, from uh, leading one of the global other aid here, uh, global health foundations. So each one of them is concerned about global health, but from their own perspective. This map it shows you on the uh, vertical line life expectancy by years, on the horizontal line income per person and it's adjusted for the inflation across all countries. And these bubbles, they show you um, every bubble, it represents a country, and the colors, they represent regions. So from blue, we have Sub-Saharan Africa, the green, North Africa, and the Middle East, 
uh, the orange, you have them here between the West and, and East Europe. And then the blue, light blue is Asia, and then Far East Asia, the red, and then the green, we have North and South America. And you can find this information on a gapminder.org website. It's for free, available for public, and you can see it over time. So what I'm going to show you here is that every context in terms of income, when, you think, when we think about the world in global health, we don't think about developing and developed world. We think about low income, middle income, and high income countries. It's all about the money. So we have 56 million persons that they die every year. What's the reason of uh, death? So we start with the top 10 causes in low-income countries. I will not go through the whole details, but we went through the main chart at the beginning, but for you just to have an idea about the trends, how they are changing. So, excuse me, if we look at the top one here, lower respiratory infections and HIV in low-income countries. In the middle-income countries, we split them into low-middle and high-middle, and you can see that uh, between stroke and heart diseases, they are similar, and then lower respiratory infections. But then when we go to high-income countries, they are slightly similar to the middle one, but definitely totally different from this one, the low-income countries. So also think about it when you are working, if you're working in Canada, this is the type of diseases that you need to, to deal with. If you are working between Sub-Saharan Africa and between South America and between European countries, this is the pattern trend of diseases. Low-income countries, that's what we need to that we, that we, that what will you be dealing with. So keep this in mind as well. That what is important in each of these settings and what is urgent. So can you tell me, for example, which disease here do you think it is important, but not urgent? Regardless of the context. Did you raise your hand? Do you want to give it a try? Road injury might not be that important. Which one? Road injury. Okay. In which setting? Uh, top 10. Uh, I'm sorry, which, which, uh, where was it? Road injury. No. No. Here. No. Here. Yeah. Okay. That. How did you label it? Was it important? Yes. Uh, no, so it's probably not urgent. Okay. It's a very emerging topic. Um, it's affecting um, obesity. In terms of, if I I'm I grew up in Lebanon and I lived in between different countries in Africa, some places that you cannot walk in, the risk to die because of road injury in Lebanon is way much higher than because of a bomb. And do I want to walk there? I'm not sure. So, uh, and then, well, if I don't exercise, or I don't walk, I don't go out for jogging, then this will affect obesity and diabetes. And that's where here also, that's where you will be always tackling these different um, topics of diseases that you need to think as a multi-silo. If you tackle this, what will be the domino effect on other diseases? Do you want to say something? Yeah. I was just thinking, like, on terms of something else, like, I think something like stroke is important, but not necessarily urgent, because there's so many factors for stroke. There's not really, if we put the urgency to it, there's not really anything we can do really quickly for stroke, it's not communicable, like the Ebola outbreak, that was something that would be urgent, but okay. it's really high on there, but it's not necessarily urgent, more so to But also in terms of intervention, how would you intervene with a stroke? At what level? Well, I'd say more on a preventative level, because if all of those lifestyle factors lead to stroke, once they have the stroke, I mean, treatment obviously, but you can't really intervene at the level of actually having a stroke. It has to be more like public awareness of health and um, public health campaigns and stuff. But I still, hmm. I don't know if those are necessarily the urgent. So if you want to intervene then on the people who have already the disease, is it late? 
as a prevention. Okay, so you have to go back to the people who are at potential risk to be, have the disease. And then how many years back that it takes time to have to develop stroke? How many? It varies. Any ra range? Give me a range. Yeah? 30 years or higher? I don't know, but I would assume it's... Uh, <laughs> I, I would assume I would assume it will be at least ten years or higher, but definitely not at this moment now, right? And that's where the urgency becomes as treatment intervention. Um, maybe diagnostics, early diagnostics, and then the rest, which is which is important, is that the prevention. And that's where you will be all also challenged. You will be challenged challenged where you put money on treatment, which is urgent, and it costs a lot of money, and it's important to save lives, or on prevention. Who's interested here to go for med school? Okay, I have one. Um, sorry? Okay. Who thinks about the idea of medicine? Okay, that's fair enough you will be always trained on dealing with urgencies, on treatment. So that's really how you'll be trained, that, you, that there's a problem, you have to deal with it right now. Two people here mentioned the time element. So medicine is about now, it's about individuals, it's about the tree. In global health, it's about long-term planning, it's about what is important, and it's about the forest, it's about population. So. This is very important for you to, to, to think about as well, like for whatever you are interested in, doing it in the future. So now I will start, I will, uh, I will narrow it down into an example. And Nelson Mandela, I lived in South Africa for three years. I love this country. Um, this shows you here the life expectancy by years. And again, this is the income. And is that a pointer or Ray? Is that is that a pointer I can use? No, this is a remote control. Oh yeah, okay. The top part here. Wonderful. Okay, thanks. So here we have in 1994 life expectancy was approximately 62. That's when Nelson Mandela became president. In the as the first president of the South Africa after the apartheid. After that, you see life expectancy start to go down and then went up again. Why? When when Nelson, before he before 1994, HIV was not a problem in South Africa. The highest prevalence rate in the world today is in South Africa, or actually also in Botswana, but South Africa has the largest population. HIV started in Tanzania when South Africa became, uh, uh, in the, after the apartheid, they opened up the borders. And that's where HIV started to increase, and then that's where it became an, a huge epidemic, and then that's why life expectancy started to go down. Was he aware about this? Of course he was aware about this. Was he concerned? Definitely he was concerned. He lost his son with HIV. But did he tackle it when he was a president? No. Why? Why do you think he hasn't tackled this topic? So he was fully aware it's an urgent topic, and he lost his son, and life expectancy is going down, so it's a big problem. Why he didn't tackle it? You want to say something? My only guess was that there was something else that was more urgent. More urgent, or maybe more important? That was urgent. The funeral business in South Africa was, was so lucrative. I'm used to see flower shop opposite hospitals. You will only see funeral shop opposite hospitals in South Africa. 
I think if I wasn't doing my PhD, I would have offered the business there in funeral. It's seriously, it's a big, big lucrative business. So what he, his approach was that he wanted to establish a country on long term. South Africa was coming out from a long term period of apartheid. Um, uh, the colored population identity wasn't, uh, it needs to be worked on. The rights, human rights, access to health care for maternal health care was important. Children mortality was important. In, in public health, usually you have two indicators to reflect um, healthcare system quality and economy quality. So when we are talking about maternal health, it's a proxy for the healthcare system. When maternal health, maternal mortality rate is high, it means there is a problem in the healthcare system. It needs to be strengthened. And that's what, what he was taught. He was he wanted to focus on. So he was working. He was serious about his work, about his job, about his country, and he went into series of policies. And this takes a lot of time to work on them, to establish a policy. So now, with when he finished his presidency and he he decided not to renew his presidency, then he started to work on HIV. It was on his agenda, but he said there were, there were other priorities. There were other topics that they were more important, and he felt that he needed to tackle them. Do you think, was this a good approach? Okay, we have one, two, three. Okay, so you agree with him? I agree with him. Okay, second. Yeah? Um, I think that, I, I mean, I also agree because he obviously, when he went into it, it wasn't an issue really. So he had everything all probably pre planned out. He had the ideas of the things that he wanted to accomplish and to abandon those ideas for this new emerging issue would be really hard and I think it would have set him back so I understand the way that he does it. Okay, you have an understanding. Third, here. Okay. That's true. That's true. And that's the thing you you said you you said you understand. And that was the dilemma when you are doing priorities and and in terms of what is important and urgent, it's you would be in dilemma between understanding and accepting these decisions. And you you need to defend them to yourself first and if you buy this decision first then you can convince others. Who would who would find find it hard for them to accept your decision? They might understand you, but they might not accept your decision. If you manage to let them understand first, that's fine. This is kind of half of the battle. But if you yourself you are not, and he did accept this decision. He accepted the loss of his son. And and then he put it sequential that it is okay. After I'm done with the foundation, as you mentioned, the back. Then I would I would start working on whatever I want to do fixing inside the house. And this this quote I love this quote because it's always important that when you when you make we um, have any task or any decision you want to tackle that you try to detach yourself because you don't want to be emotional about it. And that's why the issue of understanding the decision 
and explain it to others. Because once you set something, you don't own it anymore. It's people will own it. Like right now, whatever I have I, I said before earlier, God knows how many, I'm sure Ray, maybe he's tweeting, but uh, that I don't own anything I have said anymore. That's It's out there. So it's very important every task you work on it, you make sure you detach yourself and then you think what is really important and what's really pressing issues to tackle. And that's what he thought about it. I will go now into another example, which is now everyone talking about it on the news, the Ebola. And on this slide, you can see the, the unique number of cases here by numbers and uh, through time since January until September and you have three countries in West, West Africa so Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone and you can see the increase so it starts in Guinea and then uh, Sierra Leone did catch up on it a little bit in Liberia and now it's in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea. So what do you think about this topic? So, so far, we've got 700 cases, over 800, over 1,000 cases have died in seven months or eight months. What do you think about Ebola? Is it important or is it urgent topic? Sorry? I heard someone say, who, who's... Urgent, but not important. Who else? Yeah, I'd say like it's urgent um, and not important because it's not something that like as soon as this is like taken care of in like the world, we're not going to really be focusing on it afterwards. Like it's not it's not something like public health where it's important of like to keep establishing it and keep like changing it. This is something that's going to like we'll deal with it, figure out what we like as far as we can go, and then we're going to move on to our other pressing matters. It's not like for like years to come, we're like, okay, Ebola is still important, it's just urgent right now. Okay, I will just hold that thought. I will challenge you a little bit here, okay, not for you two as individuals, but for the room, okay? Has Is this a new topic, Ebola? Yes or no? No. The Ebola outbreak happened before. On what scale? Can you define the size of small? In rural sites. And why it didn't have this large scale? Yeah. Maybe. Molecular reasons, maybe. Any others? I s yeah. Uh, it made it into like a more urban state, so now more people were able to track it in like a smaller Urbanization, okay. So molecular and urbanization, economy-wise. Did you have a thought? Uh, or you just okay. You did you raise your hand? Um, yeah. Well, my thought was like the the density of the population, so easier passing between person to person. Okay, density. I'm just looking if I can write them down. No. Yes. Um, I think it happened because people saw it as something that was urgent and not important, so it happened again because last time they just dealt with it and they didn't care about preventive action or vaccines or anything like that. Okay. So by doing the same thing, we're basically setting it up to happen again in the future, just by dealing with Okay, I saw someone. Yeah, and then you. Can you speak up? If they have a larger agenda than before, more infectious. Diseases. Okay, so there were other infectious diseases that had much more higher priority. All right. Sewage or inadequate sewage, mm -hmm. or increased transportation systems, you're lacking the public health preventative measures that 
are going to stop the spread of disease. So I would say the public health prevention and you know clean sewage is important and urgent, where it's not necessarily just Ebola. It's typhoid, like the list. Right. Oh my God, Dre, he warned me about you guys. <laughs> I'm glad you did. It's feel intimidating. All these thoughts here in the room. I love this crowd. Someone else had a thought here. Mm, yep. In what way? Like, to, like, weren't there some cases, like, in the States, there was this one guy in Spain, too. So, like, how it got there, I don't know, but maybe the way they traveled, that's probably increased since the last time it came out. Great. Yep. Um, also, I think we need a bit more information to kind of determine that, like, the case mortality rates and how many people are actually dying of this disease mm -hmm. compared to, because it could be, like, let's say we have another infectious disease, but so the time to, to for transmission and then from transmission to death yeah. that's also a, that's where actually you, you one of the criteria for an outbreak and then that's where you have to intervene and that's become really urgent in the, the latency period between the time you acquire the microorganism until the, the time of death, and especially when there is no treatment or vaccine, then you have to intervene immediately. This is something very important, yeah. So you actually put the whole story together here, all of you, between having historically the outbreak happening, was happening in the past in rural areas, on maybe on a scale of a hospital level, it wouldn't, you wouldn't see it on the main media, you would see it in local media. People will talk about, people are dying. This is something unacceptable. Someone to die and due to any type of diseases to, for any reason, unacceptable. That's what we aspire for it in, in life, for humanity, right? But now when it starts to scale up and urbanization was definitely uh, a main factor, a catalyzer that when, you, when I showed you the earlier slide in terms of economical growth, uh, urbanization is increasing. Economists uh, use usually the, um, they look at the proportion of people buying cars in countries as a proxy for wealth. Because usually, um, as individuals, you know, you have, you improve your income and you need to move, but usually, the, to buy a car is faster than for the country to, to have a road for you. So that's where economists look at it. What's the, the car traffic uh, is like? Um, I worked in Zimbabwe, and Zimbabwe, was, as you know, that had under sanction. It, its economic inflation was really high there. Now they stopped using the Zimbabwe dollar. They use US dollar. And yet, you can see people, they can afford to buy cars. It's mind-boggling. I cannot explain it. It's happening. <laughs> Uh, so in these countries, that's what happened. Urbanization, moving around, it became, became becomes easier. So when you look at it here as well, how so the red dot it represents uh, recent cases, and the the gray dots they represent all cases. So you can see that these red dots are growing here. The whole area here in the um, in the east of, we are here in uh, Guinea. So it's, um, it's really increasing. Oh, sorry, this is, no, this is Liberia, I'm sorry. This is the northeast of Liberia. So it, uh, it is a major problem with the, with the airlines. That's another thing that high income countries, they were late in their response. And then the first, uh, people who stopped the made intervention were airlines companies. There were two airlines companies. They stopped traveling there. And uh, now it's a big, big, big thing about to travel there that there's no treatment. The vaccines and the treatment are still not tested yet. So whether to send uh, untested drugs there or not. So we, we are we going to cause harm or are we going to help but then while helping we might be causing harm 
adverse events, for example. It's not documented yet. We still don't know. So it's a crisis. It's a big crisis. And why it's urgent? Exactly as you mentioned, the issue of the, um, the period that is between the, the acquisition of the virus until death and also the virus itself, although it's a virus and it's supposed to be a semi-alive organism, but it can stay alive a couple of days longer than other viruses. So that's the other thing that now um, you might have seen some headlines in the newspapers about uh, women who are complaining that how I can see my child dying and I cannot touch my child. This morning I was on a clinical round and there was a presenter, presenter talking about skin-to-skin -skin, uh, importance between moms and babies and how this is important. And then I, for me, I was like, yesterday I was reading about moms complaining that, that how I cannot hold my child who's sick. When you are sick, when you are younger, when did you go to your mom? And so you can imagine now this whole thing, how it's really uh, hitting the social norms or like social aspects. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a sad, it's a very sad topic. It's a, it's a very sad topic. The other thing is that here I looked at the children mortality in Liberia and Sierra Leone. And so this is per 1,000 birth. Out of 1,000 baby born, how many, how many children are dying before they, their fifth anniversary, uh, fifth birthday? And then here you have the income. So we can see here in Liberia, since 1991 until 2012, it went down in, in over 20 years. It went down from over 270 per thousand down to 80 per thousand. The healthcare system is functioning. And now you can imagine with this crisis, how it's going to affect the healthcare system. You have X number of doctors. Remember the first slide at the beginning of the presentation? You have X number of doctors, X number of nurses and midwives. And you have this crisis. They will be flooded. The patients that are coming there, they will flood the, the hospitals. What will you do with the pregnant women? How would you deal with them? What about during their pregnancy to be infected? So it's time to tell what, where this will be in the coming years. I hope it won't go up, but it's time to tell. Look at Sierra Leone. That's interesting. In Sierra Leone, it went down in terms of because of the war. It went down with the income, but also it went down a little bit with the children mortality. And then here, the income is improving in Sierra Leone and children mortality is going down. So they're doing well, relatively well. To compare them to Canada, it's unfair comparison, of course. But again, it's time to tell what will happen after this because to take this down, it takes long-term planning. You have to set up a, a very good healthcare system. You have to train people. You have to have to graduate more medical doctors, nurses, midwives, access to healthcare, exactly what Mandela did in South Africa. So when we are talking about this crisis here, although people might say, well, it's a small number, yes, but besides the fact that they are dying very quickly, th this will affect the healthcare system to treat other diseases and to help other patients. That's again, if you want to work in global health, that's another thing that you would be also challenged in. What is urgent and what is important and how can you combine them together? Any thoughts or reflections about these two slides? Yep. It's in, in the former, uh, in Zaire, which used to be called Zaire, today it's Congo, and it's called Ebola because it was discovered by, uh, by the Ebola River uh, by a professor from Belgium, Peter Piot, his name. Sorry? Um, it's the, the vector are the fruit bats, and, uh, um, and there, there are other animals as well, but mainly the uh, mammalian animals, but mainly the bats. It's a microorganism that, as any other microorganism that live with us. 
Any other thoughts? Who who would consider who is thinking about a career in global health? Okay, can I ask you what you think about this? Should should you be in the field now? There is no right and wrong, by the way. Like if you are there now, what you yeah? How would you think about? It? Mm -hmm. So whether it be kind of quarantine zone set up in a lesser standard of care, because if you have it, like if you have the pump of Ebola, if you have Ebola, you're either going to make it or you're not. And there's not a ton we can do for you, so it sucks to be you, sorry. Um, so if we can get you some beds and like some good nutrition and, you know, hang you over there, keep you away from the rest of the population and, you know, use our resources, but use them wisely in order to make sure our healthcare system survives this, because the fallout from, like, the lost population is gonna, you know, cause degradation economically and socially, and so you're not gonna have as much government revenue in the future, so you need to save supplies for when everybody who's dead with Ebola is dead, and we have to move forward. All right, so infection control, quarantine patients, and control to contain the problem, and by the way, over $2 billion they have already lost in their economy. All right. And uh, we'll take one more person. Yep. Um, I agree with what she said as well, but also at the same time, if I was in charge of those kind of places, I would kind of like make a list of, okay, what are, what are the infectious diseases that kill the most? Okay. And then from then, I would put in strategies to target where they originate from, what are the vectors? what are some preventative uh, uh, things we can put together and long term we can see that we can decrease these outbreaks by looking at the source and why 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 is it spreading why is this coming back again so i think we're just so caught up on just fixing it we don't we're not focusing on why it keeps coming back so, okay so you are challenging the point of why we are thinking about urgency and not thinking about what's important exactly. all right Hey, balance is best. Yeah. Now, the other element here is that with the whole global reaction about always the, the uh, hidden elephant in the room, ethics of emergency and urgency work. Because when it's something is emer emergency, it has to be done, you'd be like, I have to do this, and later we discuss it, right? Like, right away, I have to do this, whatever you, you are talking to, there's something you are trying to register in a course. It's not happening on the system. You have to go there, right? You cannot call. You are calling. No one is picking up the phone. Um, think about it always on, on your day-to-day -day life and then try to project it to on a global level. So Because when you relate to it yourself, you'll understand exactly how it feels for people affected by the problem. So this came up in Australia that... Um, they will not sell health workers to West Africa. And then if someone who is Australian citizen working in West Africa now, they cannot travel back to Australia. Uh, you raise your hand. You have a question? Okay. Um, what do you think about this? So this, is, this it tackles the international community responsibility towards problems. And let's say, should Canada decide this? How would you feel about it? Yep. Well, um, just simply the idea of not sending workers to help, I can understand that because <laughs> not only is there a biological threat of them contracting the leaky, there's quite a physical threat as well of them back. <laughs> <laughs> Back when there was, uh, it was just emerging in Sierra Leone, they were sending health workers into villages to try to to treat them, 
and villagers were actually striking back. Like they were attacking Red Cross vehicles. <coughs> they were standing there with the line of machetes saying, you're not coming in, you guys are spreading the disease. So on top of there being the biological threat, there's a true physical threat to the workers. So I understand not sending the workers, but I think if the workers are already <coughs> there, well, if they contract the disease, I understand not bringing them back because you don't want an outbreak in your own country. But I think it's really controversial because they're a citizen of your country. Your country probably has better health care than if they're over in, say, Liberia. If they come back to Australia, they might get better treatment. So I think it's it's really like, I don't know, it could go either way. I understand, but I, I don't really think that that's the right decision to make. Okay, hold that thought. So, when was this cited? What year? In the in the in the late seventies. And until today, we keep talking about it, that the world today is so interconnected. The whole world is like small village today. Now, where, what does that mean? How much we are responsible to go and help or not to? Or to accept the risk that if I take a decision, I'm going to help, the risk is that I'm not coming back to my home country. Now, I'm shifting the topic a little bit into private industry funding and also because I'm, I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm now in my last year of MBA and uh, I was always fascinated by the private industry. Like, there are many things in health that we would be like, oh, these private industry people, blah, blah, blah. And uh, for example, the chocolate, I'm not, I'm not going to make any names for brands right now, but if there's anything that is about chocolate or about candies or about kids and obesity, etc., and how can they do it? So now I'm understanding it more so I can use some tools into global health or public health. And uh, this is a topic that in Lebanon is a very provocative topic. Cosmetic surgery, it's you can get a loan from the bank to have aesthetic surgery. And um, I have friends who went to Lebanon and they were like, oh, all girls, they are so alike. <laughs> so it's... Um, why this is happening? Is this an important topic or urgent topic? And I'm not trying to be cynical here. What do you think? How would you box it? Yeah. I say it's important, not urgent, because it's not like people are dying from buying cosmetic surgery and going to get surgery. It's kind of a social issue because people, even if you can't afford to get cosmetic surgery, they still take it. Okay. Uh, did you raise your hand? No? So it's not important, not urgent. Okay. I agree because I think that's the beauty of the free market that if you have the product and the demand, they go hand in hand and no one's being hurt and people are making money. So for a bank to make an investment on this project, there is a reason that why this topic became important because it was linked to uh, people's mental health as their uh, body perception, self-identity. And I tried to look more into the outcome if there has been any studies done to look at whether this has improved mental health or not. Um, there has been some recent articles that show that actually it's going back. So it's kind of you take a peak and then it goes down again. Um, I, it's not my area, so I'm not really good at this topic, but I tried to really tackle it to understand, like to, to understand more the, from public health perspective. Was this a good intervention or not? Yeah. I don't think it is, because it's basically saying, okay, yeah, you are ugly, so go and change your face. That's basically what it's saying. Like, it's accepting that, like, it's not saying, no, everyone is beautiful in their own way. Mm -hmm. It's not fulfilling that idea. It's saying, okay, we acknowledge that you don't look good, so here's the solution. 
Yeah. But I think that's why it, I don't think it would be for better mental health. And I think it's not, not the proper way to deal with it. Okay. By the way, the reason I put this here, just as I was hoping everyone would agree with me that it's not important and not urgent, so that I can box it as an example. But again, I'm not expert on this topic, and I'm not trying to be cynical. So just to put it there. OK, you had some. You're talking about like a fundamental shift in societal norms, especially around healthcare spending. Mm -hmm. like if you deem that it's important to spend $50,000 on your insurance, then you're going to be something changing in society. More importantly, like look at that picture. In Lebanon, is that the picture we should be having on a billboard? Little white, blue eyes. I don't, I don't know if that's the standard of beauty you want to be promoting. Mm. That's a good point. I mean, if you go back in time, I tried to do some research to see when would be in, in North America. This was the trend. I think it was when? 60s? 60s, 70s? All right, now back to this table. So now I would, I would start wrapping up here. Um, so most of you have actually put up the definition here that what is really urgent and important, that something has to, needs your immediate attention right now. Well, if it's not urgent, that you can have proactive actions that in terms of prevention, et cetera. When it's not important but urgent, um, that they appear to be worth doing, and I'll show you examples later on and not urgent, not important, it's time-wasting activities. So how would you deal with it? That it's a necessity and you have to reduce it right away, like the Ebola, we have to stop it. We have to contain the problem. Um, it is important, but not urgent. It's a quality and then you increase it, you work more on it. Um, when it's not important and urgent, you need to manage it, and then here you need to avoid it. So there's a fire, you have to act right now. And in terms of jogging and planning, this is to prevent obesity, diabetes, etc. cetera. Um, if it's not important but urgent, like my work made the deadline, something's happening that it can affect me, but not 100%, so I have to kind of deal with it. Or your emails, browsing on YouTube, etc. This is not urgent and not important. So this is a list of, like, we can, we, like, if I, if I spend more time, I can come up with more and more topics here that in terms of urgent slash important topics in health today, uh, between outbreaks, infectious diseases, obesity, climate change, knee hip surgery, for example. I send out an email to a couple of my colleagues to ask them, what would you think topics that are important or urgent? And no one could agree on anything because it's hard. Sometimes it's really hard to make a call on what, what is important but not urgent. When it's an outbreak, everyone agrees on it because, yeah, it's, it's easy, right? It's, people are dying right now. We have to do something about it. When, when it's longer term, for example, human papilloma virus vaccine and cervical cancer, is it urgent? Is it important? Question mark. Malaria bed nets, malnutrition, children diarrhea. Every day, there's September 11. How many people died in September 11? 3,000. 3, every day, 3,000 children, child are dying with diarrhea. Every day. Every day you wake up, think about it. September 11. Do you, t do you hear it on the media? No. Why? It's not infectious. Anything that is not infectious, it doesn't make noise on the media. So this is, again, as I said, I, I was running this by my colleagues and some, like we, I tried to see where there is a consensus. So definitely infectious diseases and outbreaks, it's something urgent and important topic because it's infectious. When it comes to not important but not urgent, so obes obesity, climate change, knee hip surgery, children immunization, it's important because like children immunization last year, you heard about the outbreaks that happened for two or three kids in Ottawa. 
right? On the West Coast, there were also many cases. So why this is important to deal with? Because if you don't manage it well, it will shift here. And then when it shifts here, it will cost a lot of money, a lot of money. And also, by the way, the costing to contain a problem, that's a very important factor as a decision maker because you don't usually have an allocated fund in your budget. You won't say, for example, if you are a minister of health, oh, this year I have $200,000 for outbreaks because this shouldn't happen. But when this happens, you'll be shuffling around your staff, you'll be borrowing staff from other departments, you will ask the staff to work overtime. And, and now here I'm talking North America. So mind you, if you are working in low or middle income countries where you have to fly there and you have to, sh to, you have to deal with the logistics and the costing as well. So that's another area, the money. Flu vaccination, not important, but urgent. What do you think? Do, do you agree about this? Who takes the vaccine, flu vaccine every year? Okay. Do you think it's important? I don't know, I'm just asking because uh, as I told you, it's that among I think six or seven people, we couldn't agree about these here. <laughs> yeah. I think that it's urgent because there's a limited window for the flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's always the same time of year. It's you know, put out within a month or two. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily important because, I mean, I personally get it every year, but I have friends who've never gotten the flu vaccine. They've never died from the flu. Most of them never even gotten the flu. Like, it's not, I don't know, it's not a pressing issue. Like, if you don't get the flu vaccine, you're going to die. So, I mean, I agree with that. It's pressing. It's, so there's a U-shaped curve for the risk group, the youngest group, and the oldest group. This is the, the highest risk group. It's U-shaped. So for your age category, it's the lowest group. It's a risk, but it's the lowest. I'll take one more. Yeah. 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 And cosmetic surgery, I'm glad everyone would agree here. As we have a consensus, at least in the room, um, about it, because I need to have an example. Or can you think of an example that is not important, not urgent? That would be great if you can share it with me. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I, I, I think cosmetic surgery is important and not urgent. But that also depends on the context of the society as well for me. That's because like, I know like, there are certain countries where if there's stigma if you're physically unattractive. And so you know, you get a job, you get married, just just to succeed in your social life, you would need cosmetic surgery to look beautiful. Because you know, I know certain countries mm -hmm. where where you where, where when you give a resume to someone, they want your picture on it. And if it doesn't look good to them, they're not gonna accept it. So that's so you brought up a very important topic, dogma. Dogma and norms. Um, the analogy of it is in the HIV world that there are some... Um, so the whole perception of the media w for HIV patients, they get skinny. And I have met people in South Africa that they are HIV negative, but they keep eating to look obese. And this is observation, so I'm not referencing any literature here, just my own observations, okay? So, um, and this is, this is the dogma, it's a very important topic. So what you're talking about here is the context, depending on the context. So that's a good point that maybe I should have added between bracket, depending on the context. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. 
what topic would you think about that that fits here? And I think I'm running behind beyond. Behind. Okay, great. Thanks. I haven't heard from anyone here. I'm putting the spot. Okay, I'm moving pick up. You. Yeah. What do you think about any topic here? Be, yeah, uh, something else. You, you, okay, no, something else, another, another. Yep. Shouldn't we not be focusing our effort and money on health that falls into that category? Like, we shouldn't be able to think of something that falls in the not urgent and not important category. I, in my personal opinion, like why would we be focusing on health interventions that do fall in that category? That's why I, like, I, I couldn't think of anything off the top of my head. What if I uh, think of um, medical checkup? What do you think about it? Who spoke about diagnostics here? Yes. Medical checkup. Do you think it has to be done every year? So, sorry, just I, I, would, I would take, oh, I'm glad now there are more hands. Just to let you think about it, because at the beginning, we're always thinking and focusing on the diseases, on the outcome. Now, let's think about the healthcare system that if you are um, a clinician working in the hospital, you will have two categories of patients, of people coming in. Patients who are sick and people who want to have a checkup. And they are taken from each other times. So that's why sometimes um, clinicians, they will do what is called triage, that you will select the important cases that requires immediate attention and the rest, you to ask them to come back to the second day. So what about medical checkup? I saw your hand there. Yeah. Well, it's important because if you have cancer or you think you have cancer and you want to do it in a month or something, and the doctor says, oh, uh, but it doesn't hurt, there's no pain, so you ignore it and you come back next year, it's already quite right honest to it. Okay. I saw another hand, someone else. I, I would put it almost in the same category as flu vaccination mm -hmm. because when you go to the doctor and you get like your your like checkup, they ask you questions and um, like things that you might not necessarily think are super um, like habits you have that you may not necessarily know are really bad. Or mm -hmm. doing and they just like bring them to your attention. And they like urge you to do things like. Um, they ask you if there's any change in your diet. For like a personal experience, like um, I I stopped eating meat, so they're like, oh well, maybe you should get your iron levels checked. And I did have low iron, so that was something that was really important for me. And like um, if you're like, let's say you're uh, having cancer treatment, and you go to the doctor and like, oh, have you had any changes? Oh yeah, I started like drinking St. Moritz tea or like something mm -hmm. like that, like just. You may not know that that like interacts with everything, <laughs> like drinking grape juice. It just it brings up your intention that could have very detrimental effects later on. So I think it's so, and I also think about the time. On this note, what's so the, what you mentioned now is the um, what is important from patient and healthcare provider perspectives, mm -hmm. and that's also aligned with what you said. And what you said about this as mental health, that what can be important for people might not be important from the healthcare system perspective. And so for you, what is important that, for example, a diet or you want to, you know, have a checkup for cancer, for example, that's something important for both. Both parties will agree about it, patients or individuals and the hospital or the clinicians. And that's where the discrepancy would happen when people will have different priorities or what is important for me and might not be important for them. And that's another thing that you need to deal with it. Again, back to Ebola. What is important to contain the problem 
here that you ask people don't touch each other but socially it's hard you cannot expect that we are not robots so you cannot expect people to immediately switch this importance like when you are in the airplane what they ask you to do when they show you how to use the the masks <clears throat> they show you if you are if you have a kid you put on the mask first in case of emergency and then you give it you put the mask to the kid right why because it's important for you as an adult to stay alive first so then you can take care of the kid and not all parents at least my friends I know them they agree with this because they feel well I have to rush to save my kid so that's again that what is important is that from each person perspective, and that's where you can meet halfway someone mentioned the word my, my favorite word balance so balance is best however should you decide to um, to go into the career of global health always remember I love this this quote that that you are stepping into area where you are telling the world you, you want to take responsibility of people and that's where you have to make your the best that you can to protect them so good luck with your choices thanks broadcast at least we had exactly two live watchers at the time.